The following presentation was produced by the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So this is requesting the three refuges and the five precepts. I often say this is a core part of Buddhism. The three refuges is you know, to the Buddha and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha. It's never to any one particular teacher, so we never so take refuge in uh, uh, Ajahn Aranavihari or Ajahn Brahm or Ajahn Cha, it's always in the Sangha. And it doesn't matter where that Sangha comes from, the what land they come from, as long as they're good Sangha, then we take refuge in them and the whole institution. And uh, also uh, with the Buddha, I know that people like taking photographs of me, but you don't need to take photographs of me because even the Buddha said, the one who sees the Dhamma, sees the Buddha. So if you can take a photograph of the Dhamma, that's even better than taking a photograph of the Buddha. <laughs> but anyway, that this is our tradition, and if it brings people inspiration, that's wonderful. And also the five precepts, it's not intentionally killing any living being, and it's uh, not stealing, taking what's not yours. What a wonderful place this would be, if we could go into temples knowing it was safe, no one's going to kill us, we can leave things around knowing that uh, people aren't going to steal things from us, that we didn't have to worry about um, sexual abuse of children or minors, that everybody was actually very honest and uh, very caring. Why people do that, especially as Buddhists, you know, we should always be very, very restrained, making sure whatever actions we do do not harm another. And not lying. And one of the reasons why we lie is because for sometimes people think it's in their interest to lie. And of course, and eventually a lie catches up with you. When people ask me in Indonesia, is there such a thing as a white lie? Lies don't have color. <laughs> just, and even if they think, oh, it's worthwhile at the beginning, usually at the end, they get dirtier with use, and they certainly end up being a, a dark black lie. But uh, lastly, again, the alcohol and drugs, the non-medicinal drugs. There's no reason to take alcohol. I had a very wonderful social life when I was a lay person without needing to take alcohol. And then uh, sometimes we do it through social pressure, but you don't need to do that. There's wonderful ways out of taking alcohol. And even small amounts of alcohol have been proved not to be good for your health, let alone the non-medicinal drugs. Drugs which are, um, are um, prescribed by your doctor, there's no problem at all. But keep out of the way of uh, recreational drugs, which really mess up your mind. So those are the three refuges and the five precepts. So when we take these, we usually put our hands up like this, and don't be like what happened in Thailand years ago. In Thailand years ago, when people put up their hands like this, I saw some people with one finger down. <laughs> and I never saw that when I was with Ajahn Chah. And I asked, why? He said, oh, because they still chant. All the, they do the whole chanting. But it means the one finger down means we're only keeping four precepts today. <laughs> and I sometimes say, why is it the middle finger? What middle precept are you not taking today? <laughs> So please make sure that if you're going to, take the, going to take these, take them properly. And especially today, people say, oh, well, business. You're not doing any business today. It's Sunday. It's Waysack Day. So at least, you know, for one day, keep those precepts and keep them perfectly. And then you're a good, you feel good about yourself. You can actually do something which is real Buddhist. So we have some chanting there. Which is, oh, we go, it's the easy one. It be so. It may sound easy, but it's also very profound. Uh, one of the things which I always remember, Venerable Vihari, where it says, even the Buddha uh, was the Anuttara Purusa Dhamma Sarati Sata, the teacher, the unsurpassed teacher of those who can be taught. Because I've been in uh, this job of being a teacher for such a long time, there are some people who just cannot be taught. <laughs> and even though, you know, they might be my disciple, 
Well, at least they tell them, I'm my disciple. And they say, why do you allow your disciple to do these things? I said, even the Buddha, you can only teach those people who could be taught. So it makes me feel that I'm not such a failure. <laughs> but of course, in the BSV, you've got some wonderful people here who throughout those years have grown enormously in the Dhamma. So, and there's also just these great teachings of Surakata Bhagavata Dhammo, just it's, it's well taught by the Buddha. You know, Su Akata, well declared, beautifully declared. In other words, uh, you know, when the Buddha gives a teaching, he gives it very accurately, very perfectly. And, you know, it's a personal reflection. Over all those years I've been a monk, sometimes you get into some really deep states of meditation and you wonder how on earth can you describe something so ephemeral, ephemeral, so refined and so subtle. And then you go back to see how the Buddha described it. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You know, not only does it show that you know, he was experiencing those incredible, wonderful states of liberation, but also that he had the ability you know, to find the right words for it. I don't know that sometimes when you're writing an article or you're talking with someone to get the best way of describing some, some of the deepest of teachings. Sometimes you struggle for a word, you try and search for a simile, and then you come to the Buddha and he's been there before. And some of his similes are just amazing. So that's why it's Suwakata. And also the, the, the Sangha. The Sangha who are worthy of reverence and gifts simply because you know that they have uh, they're a pathway to seeing the Dhamma and they are almost like the, the banner bearers of the Buddha. That's why the monks and nuns they're called sons and daughters of the Buddha. And so they deserve to be supported. And again a plug because Adrian is always really concerned about funding NBM. <laughs> Poor old Adrian. <laughs> He's losing his hair. <laughs> He'll become a monk one day. So that's, that's why I always say that uh, the Sangha, especially the dual Sangha, that's worthy of support. It's a great benefit for everybody in the future. So that's NBM. So these are things which we don't just chant out of um, ceremony, we actually feel those chants, we understand what they mean. Always put energy into whatever you have to do. And of course, that is also very profound. It's one of the reasons why it's so hard to get funds to build things for nuns. And while the nuns aren't here yet. Yeah. 10 again, yeah, but they're not here yet. And it's so hard to look after them. That's why it says here, whatever living beings there may be, omitting nuns. <laughs> Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or will. <coughs> See the psychology there, just. <coughs> okay. Of course, it doesn't really mean that. That's just English translation. So, what do we do next? Um, Oh, the Dhamma talk. Are you ready to roll? Excellent. So, uh, even though the full moon day of Waisak was, was last week, still it's wonderful that everybody comes, not always on the same day, but on different days, because that means that you can go to many temples on Waisak day. So it's not just one, but many Waisaks in one year. Or in one week. This is one of the great ways of uh, remembering that yes, we do have the opportunity to actually to celebrate, but uh, celebrating on a day which is convenient for everybody, like on a Sunday when people have the day off. I know that sometimes uh, people can get so um, uh, strict with their ceremonies and sometimes what are those ceremonies there for? The ceremonies are there to inspire to give people an opportunity to learn the Dhamma, to practice the Dhamma. And this is one of the reasons why that we do need to get to the heart of Buddhism, to get to the heart of those teachings 
in order to really appreciate exactly why we come here and why we do what we do. And of course, once one understands the heart of those teachings, sometimes I know I do get some criticism that you, know, you can actually do the wonderful chant like the Metta Sutra and make a little bit of fun of it, but it's only just not really fun for the sake of fun, but the sake of, for the fun for the sake of pointing out some of the weaknesses in uh, modern Buddhism. Things like, um, uh, may you be content and easily satisfied, not proud or demanding in nature. Because, you know, sometimes that we can ask for so much and people can be very, very proud. And, you know, I have to watch out for that because, you know, I'm a very senior monk now. Just, you know, when you start off as a monk, after, you know, 10 years, you know, you can call yourself a terror, or people actually call you a terror. And after 20, how many reigns have you got now, Fennel? 13. 13, one, three, or th one, three? One, three. You're a terror now. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> and after 20 years, you're called a, a Mahatera. Mahatera. But then after 20 years, there's no more promotion. <laughs> so I thought that's really unfair. So after, after 30 years, I thought it's only it's logical, reasonable. After 30 years, what's after maha? It's mega. <laughs> so after 30 years, you should be able to be called a mega terror. And after, I'm 45 years now. So after 40 years, a giga terror. <laughs> and that explains me, giggle terror. <laughs> <coughs> But you know that sometimes I go to some conferences and they sometimes call you venerable and then most venerable and then what happens after most venerable? Extremely most venerable or the supreme extreme most venerable and you know, there's something terribly wrong about that. You know, like a monk is just a monk. We're supposed to have renounced all of that and you know, all of that, you know, the chief Nayaka and the Sangha Raja and the whatever else you get, all those sort of titles, you know, even the best thing is just to try and even just not really bother with them too much. Because it's something which can corrupt you with the, what the Buddha said, gains, honor and fame, Lapa Sakara Siloka. So instead of that, we just try, as best we can, as a good monk, a good lay person, is to, to remember, well, no, this is what Ajahn Chah used to teach me, that we practice not to gain things, not to attain things, but to actually to let go of things, to see how much we can let go of gains, honor, and fame. And that was one of the wonderful things about coming to um, a country in the West like Australia. Because even, oh, okay, you can come in. No, you're welcome. Ehi Pasiko. Come in, come and see. Okay, you want to go that way? Okay, around the corner. Very good. Oh, it's the, the paparazzi. Oops, very good. So that uh, <laughs> for the, the, uh, the gains, honor, and fame thing, that's one of the reasons why it's really important to try and even like disappear. I always remember the story of the Buddha that when you know, he was uh, traveling, he would stay at places and nobody would know who he was. There was that story of uh, when uh, one of his disciples, one of his chief disciples who went to the west coast of India and uh, obviously did extremely well there and he had one of his disciples who was, uh, after his first basic training, asked permission to come and visit the Buddha because he'd never seen the Buddha before. And the only way to travel across India in those days was walking. And so he was walking stage by stage towards the Ganges Valley to try and find the teacher of his teacher, who was the Buddha himself. And so one evening, in, on his journey, he came to a, a little uh, worker's hut and asked if he could stay the night at the, in the workshop which apparently was uh, a common practice for monks in those days. And so the, the worker said, no, no trouble at all. 
And so lay down some straw and he sort of rested the night in the workshop. That's what his plan anyway. But then a short time later, another monk came and also asked if he could stay the night in the workshop. And so these two monks, Buddhist monks, they were uh, there in the same workshop and in the evening the monk, one of the monks started to meditate, so the other one meditated and then they were meditating all night together. They never slept. And in the morning, the monk who came second uh, came afterwards and said, oh, you're a very, very good meditator. You know, who's your teacher? And he said, oh, my teacher is a disciple, a very close disciple of the Buddha. And that uh, I've never seen my teacher's teacher, so I'm on the way to see him. And then the monk said, well, who's your teacher? And then the other monk said, I haven't got a teacher. I'm the Buddha. Ah! Spent all night meditating with the Buddha and didn't realize it. And I thought that was an understanding of like, the humility you know, of even a Buddha. He didn't ask to have the best seat. He didn't sort of ask to have most of the straw. He didn't ask for anything. He just was a monk who no one knew or well, that monk never knew, because he'd never seen him before, who he was meditating with and sharing this, this very simple abode with. And that degree of simplicity always really inspires me as much as possible for monks to try and live simply and try and set an example of virtue and morality, where virtue is morality, and simplicity. And of course, I think that uh, many of you who uh, pick me up from the airport or send me to the airport are sometimes surprised at my, my baggage, my luggage. So where are you who picked me up from the airport yesterday? Oh, over there, okay. still. But anyway, you saw my baggage, my suitcases. It was just you no know, one... Monk's bag, a, you know, we call it sort of a, a little brown bag. And from here, I'm going over to, to Thailand, and then from Thailand to Singapore, and then from Singapore back to Perth, that's all my baggage. And I like to actually to, to try and let people see that monks can live simply, to set an example. And unfortunately, that when I do go to, to Thailand, it's to teach a retreat in a big hotel. One of the problems there is that because I'm a monk, you know, because you know, I'm a senior monk, oh, I've got to say something about that. Say this is my 45th year as a monk. And it's Waisak Day. And you know the Buddha was enlightened on Waisak? And he died on Waisak. 45 years <laughs> after his enlightenment. Ooh. Perhaps this cough is more than a cough. Ooh. <coughs> no, I've got no plans to die. But anyway, when you go to this, because you're a senior monk, they put you up in the best room of the house. And last year, when I think I went there, they put me up in this is a hotel, in a hotel with um, ocean views. <laughs> and I said, what are you putting me up there? Give it to someone else who can appreciate it. So no, no, because out of respect. So as soon as I got into that room, I looked through the window. It wasn't ocean views. It was girls in bikini views. <laughs> <laughs> it was Phuket on the beach. So, of course, what I did was close the curtains and I never opened them again for eight days or seven days. What a waste that was. <coughs> anyway, people are like that. They want to sort of try and treat you, but sometimes just a simple room is enough, just like my cave, my lovely cave. But we try and teach by example, not just, you know, by, by words. So that's one of the important things. And it's great to see the monks and nuns you know, here, who come and frequent the BSV, they're very good monks and nuns. So it's very good to, to, to see that you've got some good, good ones here. 
And it's also one of the reasons you have good monks and nuns because you've got good lay people who also keep those five precepts. The two will always support one another. Just like in the time of the Waisak ceremony, where just you know, the Buddha sat under a tree and just became enlightened. He didn't, he didn't become enlightened just by study or by uh, asceticism, just by finding a wonderful middle way. And unfortunately these days uh, you know, people do have that tendency to either indulge in sensory pleasures, that's why sometimes I wonder just why do people want to have big rooms, you know, ocean views. You know, you just see one ocean, you've seen them all. They're no different. Or oh, they want to go off and see Niagara Falls. Have you seen Niagara Falls? You don't need to see Niagara Falls, just go in the shower, water falling this morning over my body. Same thing. You want to see the Great Wall of China? You don't need to see the Great Wall of China, there's walls all over the place. What else do you want to see? The Grand Canyon? Just as enough erosion as it is. Just go into the bush somewhere and see some erosion. So you don't, I can't see what people want to go and see these things. Instead of seeing their own heart and mind. So that's what the Buddha was doing. When you close your eyes and do meditation, you're seeing inside, looking inside. Instead of looking outside. Instead of trying to find satisfaction you know, in a, in a partner, satisfaction sort of in a movie, satisfaction in food, in experience. We're going in a totally different way, and that's what the Buddha taught us on Waisak Day, to go inside and find out why is it that sometimes people, they are restless. And sometimes they're restless till they die. They never know any peace. In fact, I've often noted that in our modern world, the only, there's only two places where you find people resting in peace. <laughs> the first place is in a cemetery, and the other place is in a good monastery. There people can rest in peace. So it's very good to learn how to rest in peace before you're dead. What's the point when you're dead? You can't enjoy it then. So learn how to rest in peace before you die. So you can enjoy it. And why is it that people can't find peace in their life? What did the Buddha do so that he could find some inner peace? And again, just a lot of time is we have all our goals and raising money for NBM of you know, finishing off WASAC or healing a disease or whatever. All of those goals and aspirations, whenever you want something, you tend to get tense. It's just like pulling up my robe. When I want something, I'm separated from where I am. And then you find that tension, eventually the robe will break. Or like a guitar string. If you have a guitar string, if it's very tight and somebody hits it, bing, it makes a very loud noise. But if you loosen the tension on a guitar string, then something hits it, it hardly has any noise at all. It's very low. If you loosen it that much, there's no tension on at all, then of course something hits it, it makes no sound. And this to me is a simile for our modern world. Sometimes people are so highly strung, they're so taut, a small thing happens to them and they get very upset. They have no, or they get sick, they've got no resilience. So when we learn how to really relax, to loosen the tension, if we're meditating or whatever, we find we have some peace. And finding peace in our life is one of the most important parts of the Buddha's teaching. It's finding that inner peace and finding deep inner peace. And how do we find that inner peace? You can't find inner peace through wanting something. So what do you want? 
do you want to pay off the debts for NBM? Do you want to pay off your own debts? Do you want to sort of be healthy? What do you want? Whenever you want something, you're in stress. You're stretching that string from where you are to where you want to be. So that was why many years ago an executive came to see me and she said, now this is where I am, Ajahn Brahm, in my life. And this is where I know I should be. This is you know, where I can aspire to. But every time, that, you know, I sometimes, whether in my relationship or my finances or my career, my satisfaction, I know this is where I should be, but I'm down here somewhere. And it's so much stress trying to push myself to be where I know I should be. And of course, the solution was very obvious. If this is where you want to be, and this is where you are, why don't you lower where you want to be to where you are? And then you're at peace. It's such an obvious solution. Because once you're at peace and in harmony with where you are, then you can grow together. But you don't force it. So this is where we learn how to let go. Let things be, and especially on Waysak Day. Waisak day, a time when we remember the Buddha's teachings, that it's the wanting and craving which causes the problem. Like I was saying last night at the talk about loving yourself. Loving yourself is making peace with yourself. As you are. Ajahn Brahm, you've known me for such a long time. You can't expect anything different. The same old Ajahn Brahm, the same old jokes, the same old stories. And sometimes people ask me, why do you keep telling the same old stories? It's because people keep asking me the same old questions. <laughs> and sometimes they ask me the same old questions so many times, it reminds me of that, uh, the Albert Einstein story. Remember that one? Okay, no, remember that one. Because... <laughs> Because this gentleman, he's in Thailand, he's trying to make an appointment to visit me when I'm in, uh, in Phuket. But he told me that when Albert Einstein you know, made his great discoveries, hardly anybody knew him. And once he did get well known, all they had was like, old photographs of him. They didn't have like the internet and YouTube and what's, what's happened, Instagram and Facebook. So no one really knew what he looked like just knew he was this famous, famous, brilliant professor. So anyway, a number of universities in the United States, they did invite him to come over to the United States to give a series of talks. And so, you know, had to go by the boat, as they used to do in those days. And when he arrived at New York, they got a, a limo for him and a chauffeur, who also happened to be from Eastern Europe somewhere, you know, migrated a long time ago to the United States, and they would take him from university to university on the East Coast, where he would deliver the same lecture on general relativity. And even though the chauffeur was a simply educated man, he said after five or six lectures on the same subject, the chauffeur said, you know, I think I can deliver that lecture, I've heard it so many times. And Albert Einstein, willing to be an experimental physicist, said, yeah, okay, let's give it a try, see what happens. Before they arrived at the next university, they swapped seats, and Albert put on the chauffeur's uniform and cap, and the chauffeur sat in the back, smoking a pipe, because that's what they used to do in those days, to show you, a, that's the uniform of a professor in those days, to smoke a pipe. When they arrived at the university, then of course they opened the door for the professor, who was really the chauffeur. Welcome, Professor Einstein. What a great honor for our university. <coughs> You've got to come here. And the real Albert Einstein, the chauffeur, said, You can go and get something to drink with the other servants around the back. <laughs> and after dinner, they, he gave his lecture. And the chauffeur's lecture, he'd heard it so many times that he could give it himself, and it was perfectly delivered. 
And so he got a, sta <coughs> a standing ovation from all the other lecturers and professors and dignitaries of the university. But of course there's always one person. There's always one person who's suspicious. Yeah. And so that suspicious person sort of stood up and said, can I ask a question? And he asked this really deep question on the nature of the universe. And the chauffeur, you know, pretending to be Albert Einstein, listened to it attentively. And when he replied, he said, Sir, that question is so simple. I think even my chauffeur sitting in the back there can answer that. <laughs> chauffeur, you answer it. <laughs> and of course, the chauffeur gave a perfect answer. <coughs> <coughs> but anyway, so learning how to be peaceful. Sometimes you can give the answer, but can you actually do the practice? Why is it so easy sometimes to understand, but sometimes so hard to do? And of course one of the reasons is because we're afraid of peace. We're afraid of freedom. Just like the well-known simile of the prisoner being in jail for so many years. And when you find they have the opportunity to be free, they will not take it. They've got used to life in jail. And the idea that you can be free is a bit too challenging for them. Even though they know that freedom sounds wonderful, but nevertheless, they prefer to stay in jail. That's one of the reasons why it's so hard to let go into what we think is the unknown. It's so hard to be peaceful when we're used to thinking and contemplating and worrying. So that's one of the reasons why we have days like Waysak, where we can just try what it's like to keep five precepts for a day, or eight precepts, to meditate, to live simply, and not to have so much control over our lives, to lessen what we want to, to where we are. And to see what it's like to have no aspirations at all for one day. To so let things be, just to be here, instead of trying to get something or go somewhere. So we just try it for one day and see how it feels. It's called in in prison parlance, day release. Or you just let out of jail for the day and you go back in the evening. Back. But at least you have a taste of what it's like. What the Buddha used to call a taste of freedom. What it's like just to be. Just to be here. Sometimes people ask me, Ajahn Bhan, what about you? You know, that you travel so much, you know, can't you stay still? And you know what I practice when I'm in an aircraft, in a car? I don't travel. I just sit down in that aircraft. The aircraft does the traveling, not me. I'm always here, sitting in this moment. And I sit in this moment, maybe close my eyes to meditate, when I open my eyes, wow, it's amazing. I started off in Perth, now I'm in Melbourne. But I don't move. It's the same in your meditation, to change the way you look at this world. And you. Right now, have you ever grown? Changed? You look in the mirror and you're different. But inside, a lot of you realize it's the same old, same old, same old. So this is actually where we learn how to, how to be. Be content. Just give it a try. Content in this moment and just to see what happens. Get a taste of what it's like to be a Buddha. Some, some years ago, I like to be tested out. And this time I was tested out in Singapore when somebody said, can you give a, 
uh, a session for some kids in a priest, you know, in a, some sort of school. So I turned up there and they didn't tell me it was like a preschool. These were three year olds, four year olds, there was a few five year olds. Can you teach them about WASAC? How can you teach three year olds about Eightfold Path? Four year olds about dependent origination? Five year olds about jhanas? So how can you teach little kids about how to meditate or how to appreciate WASAC? So I had to teach little kids about WASAC. So, <coughs> the first you had to innovate. So I said, well, what's the first thing about WASAC is the, the birth of the Buddha. And once the Buddha was born, he took seven steps and put his finger up saying that this is my last life and I am the best in the world. Okay, kids, stand up, seven steps and put your finger, not the middle finger, the, 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 this <laughs> finger up. And they all did that. They really enjoyed that, saying I'm the best in the world in my last life. But at least they got a feel. So the next one, they were actually play acting, sort of way sack. The next part was, now you're the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. And just um, cross your legs, sit up, close your eyes, put your hands in your lap, and imagine what it must be like to be a Buddha under the Bodhi tree. Just totally at peace, still. And it surpassed my expectations. Little children, greater imagination and play acting was, was sitting there, still for minutes after minutes. They were really getting into it, imagining what peace was like. Stillness, nothing to do. When it was time for me to stop it, the teacher said, no. <laughs> This was the quietest the class had <coughs> been for years. But then you had to stop it. And then, but they had a taste of freedom, what it must be like to have no aspirations, nothing needed, nothing to do. Total peace, to feel it. So they get used to it and not be afraid of it. And lastly, the Parinibbana. I said to all the kids, okay, lay on your right side and your hands just underneath your head, on one leg over the other leg, you're just not perfect, just like they see in the statues of a Buddha at Waste. I mean, I've got a Parinibbana statue here. And when you're laying down like that, just imagine this is nothing more to be done. Everything has been completed. You're to <coughs> totally at peace, nothing missing, nothing to be added. You're the Buddha about to leave, leave samsara. And again, they got into that too. They had a taste of what it must be like to be totally free, at peace, real retirement, totally. And again, that was the whole purpose of that little exercise, to get people to feel what peace is like, to give them an experience, a taste of it, and that was one of the reasons why that I would encourage them later on in their life to know the value of peace. You can't have peace if you want something. You can't have peace if there's something missing. So just imagine, just for a day, a time when there's nothing to gain, nothing missing, totally at ease and at peace. You should see echo of the Buddha's enlightenment 25, 26 centuries later. That gives it feeling. That is a little talk on Waisak and the meaning of Waisak today. Very good. Eight precepts? Thank you. Okay. You know what the eight precepts are? It means not eating anything afternoon and also not watching TVs. But you're allowed to watch the TV upstairs because it's got me on it. <laughs> Very good. So these are the eight precepts which sometimes people take on special days, on Poya days, especially on Waisak day. And these are the extra, <coughs> the extra rules. It's the five precepts is, you know, 
uh, no um, sexual misconduct. This is actually no sexuality at all. In other words, we treat men, women exactly the same. It's not a sex object, not as objects of desire, just as human beings. Which is a wonderful thing as a monk of so many years. You look at women, you look at men, they're just human beings. They're not sort of objects of uh, sexual desire at all. So just humans, beings, people. And it's wonderful to be looked upon as a person rather than any particular gender. And secondly, it means that, uh, you know, we, the sixth precept is not taking anything to eat in the afternoon or evening time. So there's many, many things we can uh, make use of. You know, things like the you old know, cheese and chocolates and drinks and stuff. And there's also the um, uh, not uh, indulging in entertainment. And of course, one entertainment you are allowed to indulge in is my silly sense of humor. But that's not really entertaining because many of you have heard those jokes before. So it's, uh, but not looking at TVs. And you know, when I was recently in, the, in Indonesia, people did ask me, did you watch the TV in your room, Ajahn Brahm? And I made the confession. I did look at the TV. And I'm a monk. Is that bad? And then I told him what I meant by looking at the TV. I went really close to it. And if you look at a TV, and you go close to it without turning it on, you can see a reflection of your own face. <laughs> that is deep. <laughs> so you can watch your TV, but just don't turn it on, okay? <laughs> it's much more peaceful. <laughs> and not entertainment, not wearing adornments. Like, you know, sometimes that people say, oh, you monks don't live in the real world. But we do live in a real world, much more real. I don't dye my hair. I don't use deodorants, I don't use makeup. Which is the real world? Sometimes the monasteries are much more real than actually your home. And also, uh, what else is there? I'm not using luxurious furnishings. So anyway, those are the eight precepts. So those of you who want to take the eight precepts, if you take the eight precepts, you have to keep them until dawn of the next day. You don't just keep what's called the 13 precepts. And you know the 13 precepts? The 13 precepts are you keep the eight precepts in the morning and afternoon you switch to the five precepts. <laughs> So I'm saying eight plus five means the 13 precepts. <laughs> Which is cheating. So anyway, for those who want to keep the eight precepts, I'll, I won't give the refuges, I've already given the refuges, just the, the eight precepts. And not everyone can keep them. You're not expected to everyone to keep them because people have other issues. So those who kept the eight precepts, you're not allowed to use high seats. Please, anyone who took the eight precepts who's sitting upstairs, you must come down to a lower level. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a high seat up there. <laughs> now, that's only messing around, joking. So you're much welcome up there. Very good.